should I take aught of you? Tis true I beg now, and what is worse than that, I stole a kindness, and, what is worst of all, I lost my way in't. Wit without money The face of the little boy, sole witness of Caleb's infringement upon the laws at once of property and hospitality, would have made a good picture. He sat motionless, as if he had witnessed some of the spectral appearances which he had heard told of in a winter's evening, and as he forgot his own duty, and allowed his spit to stand still, he added to the misfortunes of the evening by suffering the mutton to burn as black as a coal. He was first recalled from his trance of astonishment by a hearty cuff administered by Dame Lightbody, who, in whatever other respects she might conform to her name, was a woman strong of person, an expert in the use of her hands, as some say her deceased husband had known to his cost. What guard ye let the roast burn, ye ill clerk at good for naught? I dinna ken, said the boy. And where's that ill deedy get, Giles? I dinna ken, blubbered the astonished declarant. And where's Mr. Balderstone, and Abuna, and in the name of counsel in Kirk Session, that I sold say say, where's the broche why the wild fowl? As Mrs. Girder here entered, and joined her mother's exclamations, screaming into one ear while the old lady deafened the other, they succeeded in so utterly confounding the unhappy urchin, that he could not for some time tell his story at all, and it was only when the elder boy returned that the truth began to dawn on their minds. Will, sirs, said Mrs. Lightbody, while what hay thought o' Caleb Balderstone playing an old acquaintance sick a plisky? Oh, weary on him, said the spouse of Mr. Girder, and what am I to say to the goodman? He'll brain me, if there wasna on either woman in a wolf's hope. How tout, silly queen, said the mother, na, nah, na, nah, it's come to muckle, but it's no come to that neither, for an he brain you he mon brain me, and I have guard his better stand back. Hands aff is fair play, we mount a heat a bit flighting. The tramp of horses now announced the arrival of the cooper, with the minister. They had no sooner dismounted than they made for the kitchen fire, for the evening was cool after the thunderstorm, and the woods wet and dirty. The young good wife, strong in the charms of her Sunday gown and bigonets, threw herself in the way of receiving the first attack, while her mother, like the veteran division of the Roman legion, remained in the rear, ready to support her in case of necessity. Both hoped to protract the discovery of what had happened to the mother, by interposing her bustling person betwixt Mr. Girder and the fire, and the daughter, by the extreme cordiality with which she received the minister and her husband, and the anxious fears which she expressed lest they should have gotten called. Called, quoted the husband, surlily, for he was not of that class of lords and masters whose wives are viceroys over them, will be called enough, I think, if you dinna let us into the fire. And so saying, he burst his way through both lines of defense, and, as he had a careful eye over his property of every kind, he perceived at one glance the absence of the spit with its savory burden. What the deal, woman! Fie for shame, exclaimed both the women, and before Mr. Bide the Bent. I stand reproved, said the cooper, but... The taking in our mouths the name of the great enemy of our souls, said Mr. Bide the Bent. I stand reproved, said the cooper. Is in exposing ourselves to his temptations, continued the reverend monitor, and in inviting, or, in some sort, a compelling, of him to lay aside his other trafficking with unhappy persons, and wait upon those in whose speech his name is frequent. Will, will, Mr. Bide the Bent. Can a man do mere than stand reproved, said the cooper, but just let me ask the women what for they hay dished the wildfowl before we came. The arena dished, Gilbert, said his wife, but, but an accident. What accident, said Girder, with flashing eyes. Nail come our them, I trust? Ah. Uh. His wife, who stood much in awe of him, durst not reply but her mother bustled up to her support, with arms disposed as if they were about to be a kimbo at the next reply to, I jied them to an acquaintance of mine, Gibby Girder, and what about it now? Her excess of assurance struck Girder mute for an instant. 
and ye jide the wild fowl, the best end of our christening dinner, to a friend of yours, ye old Rudas. And what might his name be, I pray ye? Just worthy Mr. Caleb Balderstone, Frey Wolf's Crag, answered Marion, prompt and prepared for battle. Girder's wrath foamed over all restraint. If there was a circumstance which could have added to the resentment he felt, it was that this extravagant donation had been made in favor of our friend Caleb, towards whom, for reasons to which the reader is no stranger, he nourished a decided resentment. He raised his writing wand against the elder matron, but she stood firm, collected in herself, and undauntedly brandished the iron ladle with which she had just been flambéing, anglicy, basting, the roast of mutton. Her weapon was certainly the better, and her arm not the weakest of the two, so that Gilbert thought it safest to turn short off upon his wife, who had by this time hatched a sort of hysterical whine, which greatly moved the minister, who was in fact as simple and kind-hearted a creature as ever breathed. And you, ye thalus jade, to sit still and see my substance disponed upon to an idle, drunken, reprobate, worm-eaten serving man, just because he kittles the lugs out with silly old wife white useless clavers, and every TWA words a lee? I'll gar you as good. Here the minister interposed, both by voice and action, while Dame Lightbody threw herself in front of her daughter, and flourished her ladle. Illustration Am I not to chastise my own wife? exclaimed the cooper very indignantly. Ye may chastise your own wife if ye like, answered Dame Lightbody, but ye shall never lay finger on my daughter, and that ye may found upon. For shame, Mr. Girder, said the clergyman, this is what I little expected to have seen of you, that you sold give rein to your sinful passions against your nearest and your dearest, and this night too when ye are called to the most solemn duty of a Christian parent, and a for what? For a redundancy of creature comforts, as worthless as they are unneedful. Worthless, exclaimed the cooper. A better gooza never walk it on stubble, too finer, dentier wild ducks never what a feather. Be it sa, neighbor, rejoined the minister, but see what superfluities are yet revolving before your fire. I have seen the day when ten of the bannocks which stand upon that board would have been an acceptable dainty to as many men that were starving on hills and bogs and in caves of the earth for the gospel's sake. And that's what vexes me most of said the cooper, anxious to get some one to sympathize with his not altogether causeless anger. And the queen had Gina to only suffering sant or to only body Ava, but that reaving, lying, oppressing Tory villain that raid in the wicked troop of militia when it was commanded out against the sands at Bothwell Brig by the old tyrant Alan Ravenswood, that is gained to his place, I wad the less hay minded it. But to G.I.E. the principal parts owed the feast to the like o' him. A wheel, Gilbert, said the minister, and dinna ye see a high judgment in this? The seed of the righteous are not seen begging their bread, Think of the son of a powerful oppressor being brought to the pass of supporting his household from your fullness. And, besides, said the wife, it wasna for Lord Ravenswood neither, and he wot here but a body speak, it was to help to entertain the Lord Keeper, as they see a him, that's up yonder at Wolf's Crag. Sir William Ashton at Wolf's Crag, ejaculated the astonished man of hoops and staves. And hand in glove why Lord Ravenswood, added Dame Lightbody. Doit idiot. That old, clavering sneck drawer wadgar ye tro the moon is made of green cheese. The Lord Keeper and Ravenswood. They are cat and dog, hare and hound. I tell ye they are man and wife, and gree better than some others that are SAE, retorted the mother in law, for by, Peter Punchin, that's Cooper the Queen's stores, is dead, and the place is to fill, and O oh, D guide us, will ye hod your skirling tongues, said Girder, for we are to remark, that this explanation was given like a catch for two voices, the younger dame, much encouraged by the turn of the debate, taking up and repeating in a higher tone the words as fast as they were uttered by her mother. The good wife says nothing but what's true, maester, said Girder's foreman, who had come in during the fray. I saw the Lord Keeper's servants drinking and driving our at lucky SMA trashes, our by yonder. 
And is there maester up at Wolf's Crag? said Gerder. I, troth is he, replied his man of confidence. And friends, why Ravenswood? It's like a say, answered the foreman, since he is putting up Wyam. And Peter Punchin's dead? I, I, Punchin has leaked out at last, the old Carl, said the foreman, moaning a dribble o' brandy has gained through him in his day. But as for the brooch and the wildfowl, the saddles know after your mare yet, maester, and I could follow and bring it back, for Mr. Balderstone's no far aft the town yet. Do say, Will, and come here, I'll tell you what to do when ye overtake him. He relieved the females of his presence, and gave Will his private instructions. A bonny like thing, said the mother in law, as the cooper re entered the apartment, to send the innocent lad after an armed man. When ye ken Mr. Balderstone I wears a rapier, and wiles a dirk into the bargain. I trust, said the minister, ye have reflected weel on what ye have done, lest you should minister cause of strife, of which it is my duty to say, he who affordeth matter, albeit he himself striketh not, is in no manner guiltless. Never fash your beard, Mr. Bide the Bent, replied Girder, and canna get their breath out here between wives and ministers. I ken best how to turn my own cake. Jean, serve up the dinner, and nay mare about it. Nor did he again allude to the deficiency in the course of the evening. Meantime, the foreman, mounted on his master's steed, and charged with his special orders, pricked swiftly forth in pursuit of the marauder Caleb. That personage, it may be imagined, did not linger by the way. He intermitted even his dearly beloved chatter, for the purpose of making more haste, only assuring Mr. Lockhart that he had made the purveyor's wife give the wildfowl a few turns before the fire, in case that Micey, who had been so much alarmed by the thunder, should not have her kitchen grate in full splendor. Meanwhile, alleging the necessity of being at Wolf's Crag as soon as possible, he pushed on so fast that his companions could scarce keep up with him. He began already to think he was safe from pursuit, having gained the summit of the swelling eminence which divides Wolf's Crag from the village, when he heard the distant tread of a horse, and a voice which shouted at intervals, Mr. Caleb, Mr. Balderstone, Mr. Caleb Balderstone, hollow, by the wee. Caleb, it may be well believed, was in no hurry to acknowledge the summons. First, he would not heart it, and faced his companions down, that it was the echo of the wind, then he said it was not worth stopping for, and, at length, halting reluctantly, as the figure of the horseman appeared through the shades of the evening, he bent up his whole soul to the task of defending his prey, threw himself into an attitude of dignity, advanced the spit, which in his grasp might with its burden seem both spear and shield, and firmly resolved to die rather than surrender it. What was his astonishment, when the cooper's foreman, riding up and addressing him with respect, told him, his master was very sorry he was absent when he came to his dwelling, and grieved that he could not tarry the christening dinner, and that he obtained the freedom to send a SMA runlet of sack, and an anchor of brandy, as he understood there were guests at the castle, and that they were short of preparation. I have heard somewhere a story of an elderly gentleman who was pursued by a bear that had gotten loose from its muzzle, until completely exhausted. In a fit of desperation, he faced round upon Bruin and lifted his cane, at the sight of which the instinct of discipline prevailed, and the animal, instead of tearing him to pieces, rose up upon his hind legs and instantly began to shuffle a saraband. Not less than the joyful surprise of the senior, who had supposed himself in the extremity of peril from which he was thus unexpectedly relieved, was that of our excellent friend Caleb, when he found the pursuer intended to add to his prize, instead of bereaving him of it. He recovered his latitude, however, instantly, so soon as the foreman, stooping from his nag, where he sate perched betwixt the two barrels, whispered in his ear, if only thing about Peter Punchin's place could be aired their way, John, Gibby, Girder wad mack it better to the master of Ravenswood than a pair of new gloves, and that he wad be blithe to speak why Maester Balderstone on that head, and he wad find him as pliant as a hoop willow in it that he could wish of him. Caleb heard all this without rendering any answer except that of all great men from Louis the Fourteenth, Downwards, namely, we will see about it, and then added aloud, 
For the edification of Mr. Lockhart, your master has acted with becoming civility and attention in forwarding the liquors, and I will not fail to represent it properly to my Lord Ravenswood. And, my lad, he said, you may ride on to the castle, and if none of the servants are returned, Wilk is to be dreaded, as they make day and night of it when they are out of sight, ye may put them into the porter's lodge, Wilk is on the right hand of the great entry, the porter has got leave to go to see his friends, essay you will meet no aim to steer ye. The foreman, having received his orders, rode on, and having deposited the casks in the deserted and ruinous porter's lodge, he returned unquestioned by anyone. Having thus executed his master's commission, and doffed his bonnet to Caleb and his company as he repassed them in his way to the village, he returned to have his share of the christening festivity.